You are listening to the best of the Dennis Prager Show. To be or not to be, that is the question. Where was God? Isn't God supposed to be good? Isn't he supposed to love us? Does God want us to suffer? Ten years, you're not finished yet? Morning! Why did you do this to me? Who are you? Bruce? I'm God. Bingo! Yahtzee! Is that your final answer? Our survey says God! Bing, 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 bing. Well, it was nice to meet you, God. Thank you for the Grand Canyon, and good luck with the apocalypse. Welcome, everybody. Dennis Prager here, the Ultimate Issues Hour. Every Tuesday, the third hour of the show is devoted to some great issue of life. There is no issue greater than the one I am about to discuss with one of America's leading thinkers, Dinesh D'Souza. He has uh, just written a book on the subject, and that is the question of God and pain and the vast amount of unjust pain that is experienced by mankind, and for that matter, to his credit, animals, which I have always thought was an issue as well. Dinesh D'Souza, first of all, uh, let me uh, welcome you back to my show. Uh, Dennis, it's uh, always fun to be on the show. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's a delight, and I just want to mention that Dinesh D'Souza is now president of the King's College in New York City. And why don't you give us a 30-second uh, statement about the college? Well, the college is a Christian liberal arts college. It's uh, conservative, free market oriented. We have no tenure. We have about 500 students. Uh, we're small. We're 12 years old. Um, and the idea is to have a Christian college in the middle of the secular city. A lot of Christian colleges tend to be tucked away from society. Uh, they almost uh, a shelter from the mainstream institutions of society. But our students want to take a Christian and free market worldview and go to Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch or Capitol Hill uh, or Hollywood. So our idea is to prepare young people to go into the mainstream and make a difference. Well, that's wonderful. And you're located in the Empire State Building? We are. We might well be moving to uh, Wall Street um, uh, because we've had a 10-year lease of the Empire State Building, and that's up. So we're looking at some other options. But, no, we've been in the, we, wanted, uh, we were very deliberately in, that, in the Empire State Building because we wanted to, that to symbolize the fact that we're a Christian college that's right in the middle of things. Hmm. Salem Radio's New York uh, station is uh, both in New Jersey and at the and at the Empire State Building. So if you're still there when I next broadcast from there, I'd love to say hello. Well, Dennis, as you know, I've substituted for you a couple times, and usually I just take the elevator eight floors up, and I'm right there. That's right, exactly. All right, so I'll have to do that. Listen, I got to tell you about me and this subject. Uh, there is a joke that one of my friends uh, told many years ago, so you can imagine how long it's been true. Uh, he said, Dennis will buy any book that has a a anything in the title about God and suffering or God and evil. It 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 and it's true. I have a library of this, and I finally concluded a few years ago that I don't think that there is really much new to be said. So I first congratulate you uh, on taking the subject. It is called God Forsaken. Bad things happen. Is there a God who cares? Yes, here's proof. And that's pretty direct. Again, God Forsaken, uh, the book is up uh, at uh, DennisPrager.com. All right, so let's begin with the, uh, the question, and then we'll have some of your answer. Is the question that you deal with uh, the, the obvious one that people scream and shout and then claim they're even atheist with regard to because of this? If God is so good and God is so powerful... Why is there so much unjust suffering? Is that the question? It, it is, although I think part of what drove me to write this book is two things. One is I noticed that the, this is a sort of atheist trump card. Um, I've been debating a number of the leading atheists, and they start out with a, a, a standard litany of arguments. You know, religion is, the, is behind the terrorism and violence of the world, uh, or the idea that evolution disproves the existence of God. But when you beat them back on those arguments, they usually find refuge in the uh, God and suffering argument. So I notice that that's something that they always come back to. The other thing I notice is that a lot of be religious believers um, struggle with this. You know, people are merrily going along in their faith, 
feeling really good about God, and then something really bad happens to them or happens to their kid, uh, and then uh, they turn in despair and basically say to God, you know, why'd you do this? So uh, this is what I call wounded theism, uh, the, the believer who is anguished by what God has done or, or, or failed to do. Uh, and so this is common ground. This is something that atheists, you know, in a sense, use against the faith, but it's also something that believers wrestle with. And that's why it's a great subject for a book. It certainly is, that, that, as I was saying. So let me just understand, do you believe that when terrible uh, and unjust suffering occurs, as... I mean, it, it, the examples are endless, whether it is breast cancer in a 30-year-old mother uh, or it is uh, the tsunami wiping out a village of, uh, uh, we presume, decent people in, in Japan. Do you believe that God directed that woman to get breast cancer and God directed each of the victims of that tsunami to die or not? No, I, I believe not. Uh, but but if you say not, you still you now have a big burden because you're now saying... Uh, that, you know, as believers, I think we both would hold that God is sovereign over the world. God certainly has the power over the world. So you now have to give a really good reason for why God would do two things. One, why would God allow human beings uh, the freedom to go out into the world and hurt other people, do really bad stuff uh, that goes beyond, you know, normal insensitivity? Uh, why would God allow that? And second, why would God create a world of laws in which these same laws uh, would allow fire to consume whole villages, uh, avalanches, tsunamis, earthquakes, disease, predation in the animal kingdom. You've got to explain why God would, in a sense, release the world out of his direct control and let this stuff happen and not jump in and stop it. Right. So let's take uh, part two and then we'll, we'll, the natural suffering, then we'll go to man-made uh, as part two. Uh, or. or well, I'm just reversing your order. So let's begin with that one. So I, I am, by the way, in total agreement. I think God allows these things to happen. So now we go to the secondary question. Why would God make a world where these things are inevitable and random? I mean, we both agree that God did not choose every victim of the Japanese tsunami. Is that correct? Exactly. Uh, we're, we're exactly. God okay. did not choose those victims, nor did he directly do it to them. Okay, right. So go ahead. Right, so you've raised the nub of the problem. You know, for, for 2,000 years, people have defended against human evil by saying, you know, free will. And we can talk more about that. The hard nut to crack has always been natural suffering, uh, the suffering in nature, which obviously human beings aren't doing. So, you know, even insurance companies call those acts of God. Um, so if human beings didn't do them, sort of God must have. So you now have to explain why God made a lawful universe. And second, you have to explain why he made a universe with these particular laws. Now, I'll start with the first part. Why did God make a lawful universe at all? And I think the answer to that is that, God, is that a lawful universe is necessary in order for free will to mean anything. In other words, for us to live in a world where we have free will, our actions have to have predictable consequences. If I want to, if I want to show up and shoot you, I have to have the confidence that this bullet I'm releasing from the gun will actually kill you. If bullets sometimes kill people and sometimes don't, if the sun sometimes rises and sometimes doesn't, in other words, if God has a miraculous or discretionary universe without laws, then it's impossible to see how freedom can be, can be uh, paired with any meaningful consequences. So I think for man to live in a, in a free world, you have to have a regular, predictable world. And that's why we need a universe with laws. That still doesn't explain why these laws, but it explains why we have a universe with laws at all. Right, okay. So the laws are the tectonic plates on, in the Earth's crust will move and give us tsunamis, which is really underwater earthquakes and the resulting water coming onto land. So uh, that's the reason for laws. But, of course, the theoretical question that everybody in their heart thinks is, well, why would a good God make bad laws? Right. So that's, now that's, that's the heart of it now. And remember that for you know, a couple thousand years, people thought that that was a purely 
philosophical question because it was kind of assumed that if a god is omnipotent, he could make the world with any kinds of laws. So surely he could devise a world that was like our world with you and me in it, but no earthquakes and no tsunamis. So where my book is different, God forsaken, is I say, wait a minute. Uh, if, if we are inquiring into the divine architecture of the world, which is to say why God devised the world the way he did, actually science has a lot to say about that question. Geology has, and meteorol meteorology have a lot to say about why we have uh, weather patterns and tsunamis and earthquakes. So we can now give a scientific answer to what was previously considered only a philosophical question. And it turns out that the scientific answer greatly illuminates uh, how okay, evidence well, may operate in the world. We'll hear it in a moment. The book, God Forsaken, the author, Dinesh D'Souza. Prager here, and this is the Ultimate Issues Hour on the show, third hour on Tuesdays, devoted to some great issue of life. Usually it is I, it is you and I. On some rare occasions, I have some distinguished guest, Dinesh D'Souza, fulfills that criterion, and he has written God Forsaken, about bad things happening to people and reconciling that with a God who cares. So we were talking about the, the issue of natural suffering. We Everything makes sense. Uh, indeed, I'm in, I'm in total agreement with everything you have said and love the way you have said it. But there, the question still remains, God presumably knew in making the world, or did he not? I mean, there's an argument that God may not know the future given the freedom that exists in the world. But did he or did he not, in your theology and in your philosophy, did God know how much suffering would ensue from cancer, the plague, floods, etc.? Yeah, of course he did. Uh, and, you know, in Christianity, the, um, there's a kind of explanation for that, and the explanation is theological, but it's worth noting just briefly that, that uh, and this is common to Judaism, by the way, that, that God, in a sense, in the fall, in the Garden of Eden, which seems to be some sort of a protected preserve, uh, apart from the world, in the world, but in a sense not of it. And God basically says to Adam and Eve, you know, you have two choices. Uh, I mean, choice number one is to do things my way. And that's the, that's the symbolism of God saying, don't eat from the tree. Uh, God doesn't even give a reason. Uh, it's because he's God. Uh, he knows better. So either you, we do things God's way or we go our own way. Uh, and I think the message of the fall is that man, not just Adam and Eve, but all of us, uh, prefer uh, to go our own way. And that doesn't mean we're evil, it just means that we want the right to decide what evil is. Uh, that's why it's, uh, it's the tree of, of, of knowledge, the tree of, of, of good and evil, is because we want the right to choose. We want freedom. Uh, and God says, in effect, all right, if you want freedom, you've got to live in a different world. You can't stay in Eden. So here's a world for you. Uh, and this is going to be a world in which, in which there are laws, uh, and you will take the consequences of your actions. Now, what I was saying earlier about science is simply this, that if you look at something, take earthquakes, for example, since you mentioned earthquakes uh, and plate tectonics, um, it turns out that there are no other stars or planets to our knowledge that have plate tectonics. Earth is unique among all stars and planets, as far as we know, in having these giant plates under the, um, under the land and also under the ocean floor plates that move. And it turns out that Earth is also the only known planet to have life. Uh, and it turns out that those two facts are actually connected. Plate tectonics is not some incidental feature of our Earth. It is absolutely critical for life for many reasons. But, but one of the simplest reasons is that plate tectonics helps to separate the land from the water. I mean, we live on a planet that's two-thirds water, and if there was nothing separating the land from the water, then the oceans would cover the Earth to a depth of 400 feet. So obviously fish could survive in such an environment, but not Dennis or Dinesh. Uh, so the point being that all land-based life forms, including man, depend upon plate tectonics. So to me, that tends to change the argument a little bit. If we have plate tectonics, 
and they are acting as a planetary thermostat, maintaining temperature, if they're protecting the Earth's magnetic field, if they're contributing to the biodiversity on the Earth, and if they're permitting uh, land-based life forms to exist in the first place, then we can say, look, I don't like earthquakes, I recognize they cause a lot of damage, but if they are the essential prerequisite to have life on Earth at all, I've got to take a little bit of an enlarged view of them. So the same thing that brings me death and destruction brings me life. Exactly. You could say that about fire. You could say that about the sun. You know, sure, the, you know, excessive exposure to the sun will cause cancer, but would any sane person say we could do without the sun? A fire All right, obviously so, can burn things, but we need fire for civilization. Right. So you would say, essentially, that the, the question of, well, why didn't the omnipotent creator make a world where there were no natural sufferings uh, is a somewhat immature question. Uh, you're wanting a sort of paradise, uh, e even though you also want a world of freedom. That's right. You're like the kid who wants the ice cream that never ends. That science is showing us that the laws, not only on the Earth, by the way, one of the great implications of the so-called fine-tuned universe is that the whole universe has to be very tightly fine-tuned in order for complex life to exist that can contemplate that universe. And many people have, you know, uh, scientists and, and atheists have acknowledged the fine-tuned universe, but a lot of that debate is just focused on there's a fine-tuned universe, so is there a fine-tuner? But, uh, but I put that aside and I ask a little different question. What are the implications of the fine-tuned universe for the Odyssey, for God and suffering? Because if there is a fine-tuned universe, it means that God can't make any old universe and get human beings at the end. That God actually chose the laws. God set the dials in such a way that we get the kind of universe in which human beings come out at the end. And that means that, the, uh, that, means that it makes no sense to say God should have used different laws or set the dials differently. Of course he could have. He's omnipotent. But then he might get E.T. Uh, or space aliens or some other kind of creature. Uh, and the question we're facing is not, you know, did God make the world badly because he, he screwed up and made humans? He should have made space aliens. What the atheists are saying is, no, we want to exist in the world. I, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, want to be in the world. I just don't want to have all this suffering in it at the same time. And I'm saying, given what we now know from science, you're asking for something that's really impossible. Yeah, that, well, that, that sounds very fair to me. Uh, I want to ask you now to jump to the macro again, and then we'll go to the other question about the human evil. Do you think that God, well, no, no, forget God. Do you, do you believe that in the, if we could add up the joy and add up the unjust suffering of humanity in history, would you say it's balanced or imbalanced? Well, I could say that if we add up the joy and the suffering, uh, we have irrefutable proof that the, uh, that the joys of living vastly outweigh the suffering. And the irrefutable proof is simply this. Very, very few people in the world think of taking their own life. I mean, just think about it this way. Right now, we have, as humans, the means through nuclear weapons to obliterate all of man from the planet. If our life was on the balance, weighted towards suffering, and if, if we were only considering this as a hedonistic calculus, in other words, we're, we're making a balance sheet of happiness on one side, suffering on the other, you would think lots of people would have floated the idea, we've got the means, why don't we just blow up the planet and kill all the human beings in it? My point, Dennis, is that since no one has even proposed this, anyone who even right. suggested this would be seen as nuts. All right, I'm going to uh, challenge that when we come back. Great book, great thinker, God Forsaken, up at DennisPrager.com. You're listening to the Dennis Prager Show. It's the Ultimate Issues Hour, third hour every week on a Tuesday. Another Ultimate Issues man is Dinesh D'Souza. I remember with warmth our uh, debate uh, with Christopher Hitchens. I have wonderful photos from that evening, which, of course, take on added significance with the unfortunate premature death of Christopher Hitchens. The book is God Forsaken. Bad things happen. Is there a God who cares? Yes, here's proof. That's the subtitle. 
Dinesh D'Souza, the author of the book up at DennisPrager.com. So here's my challenge. I asked you the question, and it does. Uh, I'm, it's not theoretical. It does trouble me, and, and I'm as firm a believer in God as you are. I, I mean, I think. <laughs> I don't know exactly if that's measurable. <laughs> but uh, I, I asked you, did God, uh, uh, not that God, d- did, has there been an, a disproportionate amount of joy, disproportionate amount of suffering, an equal amount, you said a disproportionate amount of joy, and a, a proof that you offer is the lack of suicide. But let me let, let me let me just I, I I know you want to answer and I and forgive me but let me just offer a, a counter. In, in a in one of the worst suffering places on earth, Nazi concentration camps, there was virtually no suicide, but nobody would argue that there was more joy at Auschwitz than there was suffering. That what there was was hope. People don't commit suicide out of hope, not out of joy. That's the po- yes, I agree. But I think that I think we'd have to put hope into the joy column. In other words, hope is part of what hope is. You might say deferred joy, right? Because hope is a way of saying my life is miserable now, but I think it. I'm, I am. I am praying. I am hoping. I am betting that it's going to be better tomorrow. So true, it's not actual joy. It's almost you might say stored up in the future joy. But it has to be put in the joy column, just as despair would have to be put in the dissatisfaction column. Hmm, It's an interesting answer. So, in other words, if people knew I was here forever, they would commit suicide. Well, right. If people felt that they were going to be tortured without end, absolutely they would. I mean, look at the way, take something simple. Look at the way in which people who are really old, who are surrounded with infirmities, and from your point of view and perhaps mine, you say, wow, you know, life must be such a strain from day to day, or you've got the gout and your arm is hurting and you can't hardly move. But old people cling to life with a tenacity that says that even when they have so much less, you might say, than the rest of us, it's still worth living. It's still worth worth hanging on to. And that is because of still the joy outweighs the pain, you're saying. Well, one thing that fascinated me, and I report on this in the book, is that there have been studies that have now been done about people who are in situations that most of us would consider unbearable. Studies, for example, of people who have become paraplegics. Uh, And there have been efforts to measure their happiness through this process. Now, what's really interesting is that at the immediate moment that this happens, they feel that their life is ruined. It makes, there's no happiness left. There's only misery to look forward to. But if you visit the same guy three weeks later, and certainly six months and a year later, you realize that they don't feel that way at all. In fact, amazingly, their level of happiness, self-reported, by the way, usually moves to almost what it was before the accident. And their everyday concerns are no longer, hey, I don't have my legs, but rather the everyday concerns of the rest of us. What's on TV? There's a special at Bob's Big Boy. How, you know, my son is not studying as he should. Uh, so, in other words, what I'm saying is that humans have an amazing ability to adapt, not only to good fortune on the one side, but also to bad fortune on the other, and maintain a certain equilibrium of happiness, even though they're in situations that on the first glance may seem unbearable. Let me uh, then... That, that's fair. Let me let me bounce off you uh, another one. I wrote a piece uh, in my last column for the Jewish Journal of Los Angeles on luck and God, and that I have concluded, at least at this time in my life, that I live with both facts, that if I'm hit by a drunk driver tonight, it is my bad luck, but that in no way means that God doesn't care about me or that God doesn't exist. And I'd like you to respond to that when we come back. Are you at peace with the idea that from our perspective in this world, there really is good and bad luck and that that doesn't reflect on a non-God? God Forsaken is the book, Dinesh D'Souza, my guest. Living at the speed of light. Dennis Prager here for the Ultimate Issues Hour. Tuesday, third hour. 
Dinesh D'Souza is my guest, and his book is God Forsaken. It is up at DennisPrager.com about the, the great issue of a good and powerful God and all the suffering that exists on earth. So I ended the last segment by asking you if you uh, accept my or on board with my theory of there is a lot of luck in this life, but it doesn't reflect on God's existence or non-existence that I believe deeply in God, but I also know that, and, and I, you've already said, if I'm hit by a drunk driver, God did not direct the driver to hit me, so presumably it's my bad luck. Uh, I'm glad the question came up before break, because I've been taking the break to think about it. It's, it's a tough one, and I think here's what I would say about it. I, I agree with you completely, and here's why. Because luck doesn't mean an event that is uncaused, only an event that's unpredictable. So if you're hit by a drunk driver, the negligence of the drunk driver is the cause of the accident. It's not like it's an uncaused event. There's a cause for it. It's just that you're not able to foretell the cause in advance. You're walking harmlessly down the street, here the car veers and hits you. So the point here is this, that luck reflects the limitations of human knowledge. Luck doesn't apply to God. God knew that the drunk driver was going to hit you. So in, there's no luck from God's point of view. God knew it was going to happen. Uh, God even allowed it to happen. But on the other hand, from the human point of view, we are so limited in our knowledge that we don't know how things are going to turn out. So from my point of view, quantum fluctuations, random mutations, all of these are luck from the human point of view, right, right. not luck from God's point of view. Right. Uh, I know this is not the subject of your book, but having, you just raised it, and that is God knew that the drunk driver would hit me. I'm agnostic on that question, and it, it I know it bothers a lot of my uh, fellow believers in God, but I, I'm not agnostic because of feeling, but because of biblical evidence. Uh, I don't know if God knows what people will do, uh, and and my basis is where God said, that he regretted that he had created man on earth. This is in Genesis. That's the actual words. I, I, I teach it from the Hebrew, so I know that that's what it says. God, cre- God regretted that he had created a man on earth, and he was saddened to his heart. Uh, I'm, I'm l- translating literally again uh, uh, about what man had done. Now, if God knew what we would do, why would he regret what he had done? So I can only, Dennis, give you the, the sort of the Christian uh, state of this argument, which has been going on for a couple thousand years. It's an argument over, does God know the answer to hypotheticals? You know, does God know if this, then that? Um, and by and large, the Christian, probably mainstream, has been that, yes, God does know. God, that the, that the Bible is speaking metaphorically when it speaks about God being saddened or God being, that God actually did know, but because we're limited human beings, the Bible speaks in sort of anthropomorphic terms and treats God as if he were kind of a great father who sort of, uh, you know, didn't know that Adam and Eve were going to sin and then, uh, you know, regretted uh, that he had to destroy the world and save only Noah. Uh, that that's a metaphorical way of speaking. But there is another strain of thought in Christianity that says, no, uh, when God creates free creatures in the world, he really gives them the freedom, and they can really go either way. So, um, so God could have denied them that freedom, but once he gave it, he actually doesn't know how that freedom is going to oh, be Oh, I'm used. very happy to hear that. Can you offhand cite uh, some a Christian uh, thinker uh, that would make that case? There is a whole school of thought in Christianity that is called process theology or open theism. Uh, it's very controversial, but it's got some leading philosophers and theologians. And, the, and they're traditional believers in God. And they're traditional believers in God, but they essentially argue that God released the world uh, from yeah. his direct control right, and right. therefore doesn't always know what's going to happen. Yeah, that, that's what it seems to me. Um, I don't have a, a vested interest here. I mean, emotionally, I wish God knew, but I, I just... Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, it doesn't seem that way. Now let's go to human evil in the time that we have remaining. Talked about the natural issue. Uh, the, the human evil one. Uh, I guess you would answer similarly. God created a being, and this being has complete freedom 
to uh, sadistically torture children or to uh, jump on a grenade and save uh, his comrades. Is, 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 that, is that how you would answer it? Well, here's the point to remember about human freedom, that, you know, the Bible says God, that we're created in God's image. Uh, God is free, and God has the ability to create. And so, remarkably, he transfers some of that ability to us. Now, we are not totally free. We're the product of our genetic background. We have all kinds of things, including our own digestive system that are not in our control. Uh, but we do have a measure of freedom, and I think the key point about freedom is that if, if it were taken away, uh, not only would it be impossible for us to do vice, but it would be impossible for us to exercise any virtue. Uh, no good deed is possible uh, if it's not freely done, right? It, Dennis, if I were to put a gun to your head and say, here's a starving man, give him a sandwich or I'll blow your brains out, you get no moral credit for turning over your sandwich because I made you do it. It's only when you choose freely to act that that action counts for something. So freedom is very important, not just because it, you know, obviously it can be used well and it can be used badly, but if God were to take it away, he would be taking away all our capacity to do good. I will admit, and, and that was so well said, but I, I will admit, though, that even this believer is has been increasingly troubled as as I've seen life and read history by the apparent I mean the the vast amount of human cruelty uh, it seems almost like a defective being was created does that resonate with you at all? No, absolutely. You remember the discussion we had in our Hitchens debate about how human evil so far outstrips evolutionary necessity. It takes on a macabre quality that requires almost a different kind of explanation. Yeah, because that's right. You, that was a point you made and it was brilliant. Evolution doesn't need sadism. Right. You never meet a lion who wants to wipe every right. antelope off the face of the earth. Yeah, yeah. Back in a moment, I want to hear your answer again. The book is God Forsaken. New course just up today, by the way, at Prager University. Dennis Prager here. That's PragerUniversity.com. Dinesh D'Souza, my guest, is book God Forsaken about God's existence and all the suffering that takes place. So we have time for that point then. Uh, the last point was human evil is greater than evolution itself would ever account for, and then with specifically sadism. We don't see much of that in nature. I mean, when a, uh, as, as you have it in your book, a lion chasing a gazelle, or a cheetah, I think you have, cheetah chasing a gazelle, the cheetah is out running for dinner and the, the gazelle is running for his life. But the, it, it, they don't uh, slowly burn it to increase its suffering. What, uh, what, what does that point to you? Well, first of all, it, you know, it tells you that the atheist has just as big uh, of a problem to explain as the Christian. You know, if you start out with the argument, it appears like the religious believer, Jewish or Christian, has a problem. You've got to now reconcile the existence of an omnipotent, benevolent God with all this evil and suffering. But at first glance, it appears like the atheist has nothing to explain. We know why there's evil in the world, and the answer is evolution. We don't have a God. Uh, evolution makes human beings uh, nasty and cruel. Uh, we, uh, animals uh, survive on eating each other and so on. Uh, but then you've got to stop and say, no. Uh, in the animal kingdom, there is a cruelty, at least if we look at it from a human point of view, but this cruelty is limited by necessity. Not only is the lion not going to torture the gazelle, uh, but the lion's going to be content with one gazelle. It's trying to satisfy its hunger and maybe the hunger of its cubs, and that's it. It has no greater motive. It won't, it won't hunt again until it's hungry again. But with human beings, not only the things we do to each other, uh, but the scale of human uh, cruelty. 
uh, trying to, you know, genocide, wipe out a whole population of people that poses no, you know, threat to your existence or survival. Just this kind of uh, human evil has reaches a dimension of its own. Now, you could say, well, that's just because we've got bigger brains and can think of, you know, wh- bigger schemes. But I don't think that really does full justice to the magnitude of human evil. Uh, and not as you as you brilliantly point out here, not if evolution explains everything. The book is God Forsaken. It is up at DennisPrager.com. It's, as I say, on a number, but a rare number of occasions, it is self-recommending. Dinesh D'Souza, it's always a real pleasure to talk to you. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you, sir. Well, my friends, there are powerful arguments on our side as well. And remember, as Milton Steinberg once said, the believer has to account for suffering... The atheist has to account for everything else. I'm Dennis Prager.